for me, it's, it's after my master's studies, I came to the conclusion that it's rhythmic movement, but movement together with another person. Yes. That creates actually the, let's say, the cognitive space. Okay, to to start thinking about new concepts and Hi, to Bonga. move together. Sorry. Okay, you've made it. Yes, yes. Uh, this is Bonga. Sarah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so yeah. that that creates, for example, the cognitive space. Yes. I think to start thinking um, of con uh, symbolic concepts. That's the mm -hmm. basis of language. Okay. Yeah. And, and for you to be able to learn something like a language, you need your, your brain needs to be in a, for any cognitive task, your mm -hmm. brain needs to be in a certain state. And this rhythmic movement helps you to move towards that. But that's a really, the really broad principle. There's a yes. lot more around it. But for me, yeah. so I want to go deeper into this rhythmic movement and how does that connect with our human evolution? So wow. we started walking the way we do on two, two legs and running around two million years ago. Yes. And that, you know, if you're a long distance running runner or if you go to the gym, you run rhythmically. Yes. Your breath comes in a certain way. Yeah. And for me, that, that biological adaptation is where we should start thinking about our humanity. But oh, then and wow. also music, yes. dancing together. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make a note. for posterity so do you think humans started moving well, it started with running sorry I just want to get mm. this clear in my head started with running which is a rhythmic movement which all mammals and other things do right but we right. move differently see we became bipedal around okay. seven million years ago okay and thereafter Moving on two legs became the habit. Yeah. But then to start running or walking fast, you yes. need different adaptations. Yeah. Also, okay. at that time, there was a change in your rib cage, the way in which we breathe. So, those biological changes happened around two million years ago. Oh, and you see, so you can put that together in, for me, yes. in a package. Yes. Uh, and for me, that's the starting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. as, as you know, if we dance together, we immediately trust each other, we become friends. Um, and yeah, for me that's, and you need that kind of situation to learn new things. And a lot of music therapy, these, you know, uh -huh. for kids with learning problems and so on, yeah. concerns rhythmic actions. Yes, yeah. yes. And, yeah. and they use that to, to um, remedy learning problems and so on. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, according to what you think, we, we became bipedal. I'm sorry to say it back to you, but mm -hmm. I just, it's it's because it's such mm -hmm. new turf for us. Um, we evolved into bipedal creatures, and that rhythm then evoked a kind of sound making. I mean, presumably people were communicating already with sound, but not language. Is yes, yes, so the, 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 the thing about language is that it is language with speech is a symbolic system. Okay. And so you need to be able to store symbols in your brain in some way. Yes. And so you need a mnemonic okay. uh, to, to help you do that. Yeah. So of course your brain needs to be bigger, or it needs to be organized in a different way. Yeah. And that's a whole other track that a person can follow, brain evolution. Yes. But okay, say we understand that, and we understand it imperfectly, of course. Yes. But then, so moving together in time might have created the space, the cognitive space for us to develop the first symbols and to start from there. And of course, sounds that you make would have made in calls, for example, a rudimentary song, etc., could have been involved in this process. Right. So there, there are some people that uh, suppose we have a musy language, and I quite Ooh. like that idea too. Yeah. Um, w w could you just say a little bit more about that? So musy language supposes that musical aspects of language came first. For yeah. example, okay. something that we call prosody. 
So as okay. I speak, it's the feeling behind my words and how we com communicate and the sing-song nature, the musical notes, yeah. the color, etc. Those aspects of speech and language came first. Yeah. And then on top of that, language as we have it today evolved. Okay. And I suppose that the opposite can be said about um, music as well as like the tonal variations in music have a communicative element to them. Yeah, it, we see music as we know it today is a complete, you know, complete uh, runaway development, sitting in the concert hall and yeah, yeah, having yeah. concerts and listening. Uh, we, I think of music initially being a participatory and an action. Mm -hmm. So dancing together, even in simple ways. But the, the, the point, uh, and uh, what you're asking, uh, music as we know today, must have had its roots here as well in New Zealand language. Is that sure. what you're asking? I'm saying, you said like your the New Zealand language argument is that um, music developed on top of like all language developed yes. on top of some like prosody and rhythm yeah. and needs and like the same kind of rhythms. Like it can work the other way as well um, as like music as a communicative medium. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Yeah. yeah. But of course, the past is murky, and so you have to <laughs> develop. But that's fun to do. And what I like about it is that you can actually link it to biology. So yeah. they can actually measure people's brain rhythms while listening or making music. Uh, they can see that the way in which babies learn language is definitely rhythmical. Wow. So and so, moving them rhythmically. Uh, predisposes them to learn uh, the earliest words e more easily. So, but that's a huge field uh, of, of science. Yeah, and that yes. I'm, I really want to go deeper into that. Wow, that's so interesting. Wow. And, and any, so would this have been about two, I'm just trying to think of like the hominids in East Africa mm. and because um, the uh, Sorry, I should have remembered these dates and I haven't. Um, would those people there have used music or would they have used rhythmic movement to create dance? I mm. mean, to dance, you know, leading on to? Yes, I would say. So in East Africa and in South Africa, you've got the precursors to humans or Homo erectus, mm -hmm. starting from 7 million years to around 2 million years. Okay. So then bipedal. Um, movement. They came basically became down from the trees and start started walking, mm -hmm. uh, and and perhaps rudimentary running. So, yeah. in terms of their physical adaptations of the skeleton, around two million years ago, okay. there, there's a real observable change, mm -hmm. and so the legs become longer, the arms become shorter. There's a change in the um, in in the rib cage and also changes in the vertebra, the spaces of the vertebra. Mm -hmm. So altogether that is a more human way of movement. Yeah. So Homo erectus yeah. slash er ergaster, as some people want to call it, lived yeah. in South Africa, at uh, Stagfontein for example, yeah, in the yeah. cradle of humankind, and in East Africa. Okay. And perhaps f further afield, but we know most about them in Africa, basically. So yeah. it's hypothesized, or I think. Yes. It's the, that group of humans, yeah. Homo erectus, that started perhaps moving together in time, per, perhaps talking in a proto language, but definitely mm. having a music language. Yeah, yeah. And um, Homo sapiens. Yeah. I mean, when did Homo sapiens? Well, I know because I, I was listening to Lee Berger's book called Almost Human, which is great for lay people. Mm. And he was talking about Homo Naledi, and there's another one um, that's also very famous, and I can't remember, a species. I don't know if it was a Homo species or a... Okay. Yeah. If, if it was Lee, it was probably one of the Australopithecus, Australopithecus yes. of Deba. Yes, that's the one. Yes, yeah. so Sediba is about two million years ago. Okay. So also, and then you also, of course, get a lady. Yeah. But Homo sapiens seems to be a fork away from or a, other, another kind of human. Okay. So humans like us evolved around three hundred thousand years ago. Okay. Okay. Those are the, the modern 
modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, from a precursor called, called, called Homo heidelbergensis, or in South Africa, Homo helmi. Uh -huh. uh, it's this one skull that we find in Bloemfontein, Glorisbad. Yeah, oh, so okay. that's, yeah. I think there's more agreement these days that, that that could have been the human precursor, or even a modern human because the date is around 260,000, but just the face and a part of the cranium is preserved, so you can't really put together the, the whole skull. Right. But so Homo sapiens evolved in around 300,000 years ago. Naledi is also around 260, 300,000 years ago, uh -huh. but perhaps, not, like I said, on another branch because they look a little bit different mm -hmm. from Homo sapiens. Mm. So. I would think that Homo sapiens at that time would have had music as we know it, you know, but not, of course, concert hall music. No. Yeah. But, but sorry to interrupt, but for all intents and purposes, 300,000 years ago, we had anatomically modern. Absolutely. We had the same ears. Same, <laughs> same ears, same brain size. That's astonishing. It's astonishing, yes, absolutely. Wow. And the nice thing is here in South Africa, we've got a lot of evidence. Uh, archaeological evidence for that. Uh -huh. So I specialize with my archaeology on the origins of modern humans like us, on the archaeology, stone tools, we are the things lying around here in the boxes. So I, because those are like almost letters from the past because you can put together the process that was used uh -huh. to make those stone tools and that gives you an indication of their cognition. So from that perspective, I'm also trying to look at the cognition, but then also from the bottom up with the, with the music. Mm, mm. It is just fascinating. And um, the voice was obviously the primary instrument, but for instance, like those rock gongs, mm. does anyone have any idea when humans or before, before sapiens maybe um, would have started using those? so difficult because you can't date those. Yes. So with the rock gongs, we take the ethnography Okay. and um, what was P Bushman people and recent people from the past used to play it and there's information about that. So we take that and then find the rock gongs in the field and then you can only hypothesize okay. how deep it goes. But normally we think about the rock gongs in association with rock art. Yes. And most of the rock art date between, say, 10 and 10,000 years and quite recent. Okay. So it is in the Holocene. It's a quite recent phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So we can't answer that thing as about how far does it go back because yes. it just doesn't preserve or we can't make the links. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I'm sure it's there. I mean, why not? Why not use those rock, rock, uh, rock gongs for 300,000 years? It, well, presumably someone one day clucked a rock and said, yes. with a stone like I'm fed <laughs> up, <laughs> ooh, that sounds nice. So he put it pretty crudely. Would they also yeah. communicate through it? Yes. I mean, like talk to each other? Like I think so, because as, as you know, the, those sounds are quite piercing and mm. it carries. Yeah, it yes. So I think it could definitely have been something like that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because Tammy was pointing out those rock gongs sounded different before they settled into the ground. Yeah. So presumably if you had a rock gong, a gong rock sitting on another rock, it would resonate yes. far better. Yes, some of them are positioned like that, that they seem to be natural resonators. Really? <laughs> At quite two in the, it's close to Eisterfontein on the west coast. Yeah. So Neil Rush, my friend, yes. they actually went to fetch one of these rock gongs from the Karoo, um, but it does have engravings, and they put one there next to the museum there, yeah. and they play that. It's oh, amazing, yes. and that one is kind of a little bit suspended, you know, yes. not completely, but a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yes. 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 So in our other music work, we're interested in resonance. Mm -hmm. So you can think that that the rock gong was placed in an area, for example, with resonance. Mm -hmm. So if you have a little copy behind it, or it's if it's in a natural mm. amphitheater, it would this, the sound go much further. Yes. Yeah. Wow. So we're looking at at um, sounds. We're looking at rock art, and then how sounds would have emanated from the rock art 
area out into the landscape and vice versa. Yes. But that's something else. I'm talking too much. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> 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 Does it, I mean, sorry, I'm asking all the questions. <laughs> No, Did you want to ask Wanga? No, I didn't have a question. You, you good for the moment. Really good for how does yes. how does the like uh, the way that you're speaking about acoustics and the environment and maybe probably the plant life, the probably medicinal plants in the area, mm. what was the ritual significance of like um because I mean they didn't have like modern equipment to say uh, like you know this is an echo. Like, no, absolutely a, not. No. Is there a is there like something that overlaps with like the spiritual significance of these rocks that is is kind of um, evident in because you drawing the analogy between um, the, the 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 dating during the time of like cave cave paintings. Mm. So do you think that there's an overlap between like the sonic and the visual? that you're seeing in the cave art? Yes, I definitely think so. And that is a, a great um, field of research. So we've just been to a place in, in close to Glen William called Procession Shelter, where we're trying to test that, the sonic overlay with the, um, what we said, the visual art. And uh, so this is something that's quite well developed in Scandinavia yes. and Spain and mm -hmm. so area, areas of the USA. Mm -hmm. But it's, we, it's starting here, so. But of course, you've got to have these objective instruments and measurements and sure. so on. But that's definitely, and from the work that's been done elsewhere, there definitely seems to be areas with in in say a rock art freeze, and some areas do resonate more. And sometimes it sounds as if the sound comes from that area. Yeah. So then you can put together the actual uh, theme of of the painting together with the sound, and it gives you a completely different perspective on it. Mm. And also some sounds become louder, and it be it also acts as a as a resonant uh, space for say the sound of the river. So if you have a ritual and you want to perhaps incorporate the in, the environment's sounds, that's exactly what you'll do. You'll do it at that place or close by. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. it's not entirely incidental that these rocks were chosen? Definitely. In my them. opinion, definitely not. No, and, and one of the strongest hypotheses are that it's chosen also for their sonic qualities. Yeah, the placement is done specially on that crater. Can you cancel your meetings for the rest of the day <laughs> so we can sit here and talk to you about all this stuff? I would happily. <laughs> In Bob Young's Kloof, uh, one thing, and also imagined with all the shaman that are uh, and the Eland and all that, mm. that is also I mean what what Byron was saying, you know the there's the whole ritual, um, the dancing, the you know the with with the paintings and the and and the, and the gong and well and the and the musical instruments that they found, mm. that that would be a case obviously that that these two I mean the audio and the sonic and the and the visual would would enhance the the, 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 the sort of trance experience absolutely yeah. because what we've experienced at the scale for example if you make certain sounds it, it, you feel it in your body mm. so we just play fooled around and we sang we just hummed in certain areas in front of the cave and all of a sudden you know there was this bodily effect that, that you feel it becomes you know it becomes part of you and it becomes much louder so I think it's the it's the body the picture the sound everything and that together you go you use that to go into an altered state of consciousness exactly the, the exhaustion also the blowing of air mm -hmm. the whole also, thing yeah. it, it is the whole package but for up to you know up to quite recently we just looked at rock art all these things in isolation but actually we must think of it as a as as all of it together, yeah. yeah. Because we're so visually oriented. We are, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a big aspect of our project is because it's about the listening and our oral world. So so yeah, yeah not just the beautiful things painted on a, a sheltered wall. Yeah, and I think that is a very original kind of or ancient condition is mm. that our ears are much more important than we think in making our our perception of our world. Yeah. 
you know yeah. so and also in actually uh, learning concepts as I explained and mm -hmm. so on and your ears actually adapted so our inner ears look kind of different from our predecessors ears mm -hmm. so the inner ear bones you've got vestibular can canals mm -hmm. and so they sit in a, a little bit of a different way and you know if you've got a cold then you lose your balance and you're out of balance the mm -hmm. whole thing mm -hmm. so that also comes into play um, yeah. so it's, it's a whole what I find fascinating is that we as biological organisms are actually adapted to yes. use sound and movement in a specific way and it's like it's almost like a secret because we as you say we just look at things and it must be pretty and and so on but actually we're a whole it's it's the bodily involvement yeah of making sense of the world and our yeah. ears yeah are important. yeah well I think you, you'll know this because you've trained as a musician and so have you longer but um, we we listen very differently from other people and I know working with Jürgen and Barrent we'll sometimes say I'll say did you hear that and they're processing their world in other ways yes yes yeah and and ours is on all the time like that siren yeah, that yeah. just happened or yeah whatever yeah 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 and you become also much more irritated hey? Oh, it sounds like that. <laughs> 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 yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> and um, would those early people, say say the people who were painting on the rocks, would and using sounds and stuff, that whole gestalt thing, mm. um, would that have only been for ritual, or would it have been, you know, like for for play, or just because uh, as a human, we need to express ourselves visually or sonically. Mm. But you know, I think that distinction between ritual and everyday life is a very modern thing. Oh, okay. So if you look, for instance, at, I'm going to use the term Bushman because that's what's preferred. If you look at mm -hmm. Bushman histories and stories that they write, it's mm -hmm. much more an intermingling of all aspects through your life when you go on the hunt, mm -hmm. when you make food, when you dig for roots. Mm -hmm. It's, it's part of your life. Mm. So also that has ritual aspects. So for me, mm. it's much more, it's, it's almost like how we make sense of the world. It's, yes. it's all mixed back all the time. Yeah. And of course, sometimes you, do, you have these separate rituals. Yes. But I, I do think it's, it's not like that stark separation. Right. Yeah, and I also think then the music making and the and the movement it was much more spontaneous and part of the day, a uh, part of your everyday life. Mm, mm. So there's a person called Blacking, and he looked at oh, music, yes. yeah, uh. of of ethnographically known people, and he did. He said music is an action, and you get different musics, and it's quite far away from what we think of as music. Yeah, I yeah. think someone played. Was it Bach or Mozart to a group of Bushmen in in Namibia, mm -hmm. and they just said it's scratching. Just switch it off. We don't like it. Really? It's horrible. Scratching. <laughs> it's scratching. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. Okay. And if I read someone like Kirby's, I've got the books here recording the Bushman music. It's yeah. always like okay, it's not. It's not quite on the standard of Bach, you know. It's not the oh. the the intervals are not quite there, but it's rudimentary music. Yes. But it's just yeah. different musics. Yes, you know, yeah. it's not that music evolving into yeah. Bach. It's yeah. not like uh, that at all. Yeah, yeah. For me, yeah. And um, I, I work very closely with a composer who's trained in the Western tradition, classical mm -hmm. tradition. I don't know if you know Kevin Volans or you know of him. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, and we've been having a lot of discussions because he wants to get away from Western methods of writing in terms of development and logical sequences and structure. Yes. And he's yes, looking yes. to compose, n not to imitate African music, but just to compose in an African way of sort of addition and Fabulous. Um, yeah, 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 and he's he's going further and further with that because he grew up here um, and taught here, and he's he's moved to Europe. But he was profoundly affected by that, and I think even if we don't understand the the deepest layers of 
say, vendor music making, um, it's profoundly moving. Absolutely. Because it, I don't know, well, for me, it also resonates with the landscape. I, mean, mm. I don't know if that's wishful thinking, but I don't really care. I, <laughs> I don't think so, actually. Uh -huh. No, and I think that's a great thing to do. And what you can do then is, of course, to go to the ethnography, to the musics that they recorded. I used to work at the Dizika Museum, and they still had these wax cylinders really? with Bushman songs and so on. Yeah. And I think they managed to put it on, you know, to actually record it yes. for posterity. Wow. So yeah. uh, that's wow. fascinating. Yeah, but that's only the Bushman, and there are many kinds of, of musics, of course, with different groups. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of interested in that, but what region is it from? That is a, a replica. So we see uh, examples of that in the rock art. That's why I really like it so much. Yeah. yeah. And you see that in the Eastern Cape. Okay. And But you, there's also a record of the um, Bushman people playing that, and you get different types. Yeah. The name of the instrument okay. escaped me for the Zagora. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's not on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. Yes, and but how how people made music with that in all the different ways. Yeah. So for one of the w examples is putting the string in the mouth, and then it resonates and it makes different sounds. I even have a picture of a woman, okay, with just a string around her toe, <laughs> and then she makes music like that. Oh, wow. You know, oh. like just everyday things. Yeah. Uh, my friend Emil Rashi makes a. Uh, Flutes or pipes from from reeds, and how beautiful that sounds! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, another part of our group, uh, or another person in our group, rather, is in Paul Molikeng, who's I don't know if you know of him. He's a musician from Lesotho, but he makes a lot of his own instruments and really? receivers. And yeah, I can send you his name. Yeah, if fantastic. You yeah. And do you know Thank Cara you. Stacy? She's she's also. Very much into this field and plays quite a lot of those instruments. Do you know Cara? No. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, sorry, <laughs> getting a bit carried away here. <laughs> um, and, and, and in terms of instruments, I mean, I'm thinking of like, did people make bone flutes or yes, yes. pipes, you know, because I've also seen like people, modern music makers playing pipes with a and altering the pitch with the mouth yeah and the bottom end with their thumb yeah yeah so of course in the archaeological record things don't preserve well mm. so you could only the, the only things that actually preserve are from bone and so we've embarked on a project to try and identify those in the archaeological record my PhD student was Joshua Kumbani. Oh. You'd love to chat to him. He's yeah. over at Rock Art. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, so, but with him together, we formed this group and looked at it. So then we identified the Vurvur. Mm -hmm. You asked me what, what, get, what you get. So what mm -hmm. we identify as the Vurvur, which is mm -hmm. not necessarily a musical instrument, but mm -hmm. something you do mm -hmm. like this. So Josh. Mm -hmm. Neil and Josh and I and, and Justin from UJ, mm -hmm. we did this experimental research and Justin played it and so on. And mm -hmm. so we think that's one thing we identified. And then yeah. the other are bull roarers. What um, exactly is that? A bull roarer is uh, something, yeah, on a long string that you, oh, it's like okay. the, the um, Aboriginals still use that mm -hmm. routinely, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. But bones, I mean, the, the fossils like at Stafontaine, this was way too long ago. Way too long mm. ago, but we cannot exclude that. Mm. So mm. you can pick up anything. You can pe pick up a piece of hollow bone and it can be a, a whistle, for mm. example. Mm. So we just don't know. Mm. So what, where we have to start is at the recent past and then try and go back. Yeah. 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 Wow. Well, um, okay, that's mm. awesome. <clears throat> Something like um, instrument making, this is a question that I just had privately. Um, like the like a tradition of instrument making within a particular culture, let's say there were drum makers, my fathers were drum makers, their fathers mm. were drum makers. Mm. Their, and there's methods to making those drums, like which way the tree falls. Absolutely. And it's good luck or bad luck. So you can't really make, because I mean, drums don't last in the archaeological yes. record, but you can make 
some form of assumption that drums existed for this absolutely many thousands of millions of years absolutely and if you look at, at many of the, of the cultures in the world a drum is the basic instrument to help you go into trance yeah. for example yeah so you can and as you say it's embedded in a whole uh, stream of action so where the tree grows who cuts yeah. it almost like iron working mm -hmm. it's yeah. also it's a highly ritual and highly prescribed and if some people may make do the iron working and so on. But they don't exist anymore, the old ones don't exist anymore. Exactly. But, but that's what makes archaeology so fantastic. It helps us, you know, focus on those issues of the past. So we mm. just don't think, oh, well, it's always been the way it's now. So, and that gives you ideas, new ideas for the future. Mm -hmm. So mm. for, for me, that's fascinating. Am, am I correct in thinking that drums, if you think about current day people using and playing traditional, traditional mm. music, sorry, I know it's not a great <laughs> word, um, there seem to be more drums the further north in Africa one looks, or because I'm, I'm thinking of something like for instance, in the Western Cape, trees don't grow because of mm. the geology. Mm. So, uh, is there, am I right about that? Cause but you know, you get different kinds of drums. So, yeah. the Bushmen, for example, had the Rommelpot, yeah. so which pottery was used with the thing over it. So, oh, okay. you can, yeah, and you don't have to use wood. There's a lot of different kinds of drums as far as. As I know, it's not my area of speciality, but okay. I know this. It's, it's a great variety. So okay. I, I like to think it was a, a key instrument for a long time for all groups. Okay. Like the rhythm of running. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and it's got an immediate appeal in your body. Mm. It mm. changes you. Yeah, so beautiful thought. Like I, I never thought about it myself. Mm. Just the rhythm of running. Mm. Mm. And if you run with someone, You'll see when you go to the gym, people start yeah. running together yeah. automatically. They don't even realize it. Yeah. And then they make this music. I always listen to it. You oh, know? Yeah. So it's seldom if you, unless it's a fitness freak, but it's yeah. seldom if you run next to someone and you don't automatically sync. So it's inborn that we sync our actions. You know, so that, that is one of the biological facts of human beings. Really? Is that we sync. Mm -hmm. So as we chat, actually, we, we also mirror each other's movements. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. it's on a millisecond level. And oh, yeah, yeah. So, and there's <laughs> stuff written about that. I just want to leave all this and read all of that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'll go <with> this. <laughs> really? yeah. And drums, would they also mean like thunder? I mean, would there also be a defense mechanism? I mean, like... Yeah. To, to, to scare. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Because there are groups in um, s s Maasai groups in East Africa, for example, they not not thunder, but they make a big noise mm -hmm. together, and then they can scare lions away from their prey, and they yeah. take the and it's a known strategy. Oh. Uh, wow. Would that would that possibly already have existed before I mean Homo erectus and Homo sapiens? Yes, I, I it it might have. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. No. Yeah. yeah. I know, I mean, primates, uh, yeah. what kind of primates would, would make noise to scare somebody? Exactly, and if you look at um, chimpanzee behavior, mm. they do actually move together in time. There's this great book written by McNeil, something, something together in time. So it's one of the things that inspired me. But here he, he talks about chimpanzees that mm. start stomping their feet mm. together in time, and, and they walk around and around. Or they've got, when it rains, they've got rituals, but it's also rhythmic movement. And like you say, s scaring. So it's kind of in our primate nature, I think, to do that. So music as a form of social cohesion, yes. but also as a form of going to war. <laughs> Absolutely, the whole thing. And McNeil's book is actually, he started um, talking about how, how soldiers are so much more effective if they march together in time. Then they become something different. And they become mm. much more invincible, much more happy to do what they do. Okay, not happy, but you know what I mean, motivated. The unity. Mm. Yeah, mm. unity. And that's, but that's the movement together in time. 
And um, Lamilla, it is Lamilla phones, the ones that yeah, yeah, let's have phones. Would are they? I uh, presumably those also come from who knows when, but haven't been preserved. I or think we must just. Um, People haven't really looked for them, but in mm. I know in Asia, Russia, and some places in Europe, they're actually part uh, in caves, and people have actually played these rock formations, stalactites, stalactites, wow. and they played, and it's actually music. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's great, okay. eh? Yeah, but here I don't think people have really thought about that. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, oh, and did I read somewhere that you? We're excavating a Classy's River Mouth. Yeah, that's right. There. So oh, I'm wow. I'm excavating there. Yeah. What, what are you looking for? Um, 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 some, something with a musical focus? or That's more my modern human origins focus. So okay. that's one of the sites in South Africa where you find most of the evidence, um, skeletal evidence for anatomically modern humans. So lots okay. of parts of um, heads, crania, yeah. etc. Yeah. And there's a 20 meter, more than 20 meters of shell midden deposit. It's you're big. So we're excavating there and it tells us more about what they ate, how they lived, um, what the environment was like. So okay. we're excavating there, but it's so time consuming, you know, you take it this much off in a six week season. Really? So, and then yeah. all of this this material um, is the result and that's we analyze that in various ways. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> but but we, too nice. <laughs> we want to get to the music and Josh and I basically Josh work helped me at classes and so mm -hmm. that's one of the sites where we found the Vurvur. I was very glad to make that one link to music there. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we actually played the bird were in the cave. The yeah. five of us played it together. Yeah. Amazing. It's completely amazing. And Josh also played the you know, the um, bull roarer there. Yeah. 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 And the inside of the cave of course it resonates. So you stand outside and it sounds like something different. Yeah. To me it sounded like a leopard coming over the hills. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I must almost almost go for a minute. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. I know. Oh! Oh, I thought, no, no. Recognize, give me five minutes, okay. Okay. Oh, oh yeah, right. <laughs> no, but I've got another meeting like that, you know. But she must just come in between. But oh, you know, I'm really enjoying this so much. <laughs> we, <laughs> we could carry on. <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, um, I guess you're super busy, but could we maybe book another date once we've digested this? And Absolutely. Because I'm sure we're all going to have more questions. Yeah. I would love this, it. This is just fascinating. Okay, yeah, I do think so. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm going to classes from tomorrow until Monday, but then oh, I'm right. back next Tuesday. Okay. And then it's it would be great to carry on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm just for, as one muso to another, if there's anything I can tell you, I'd be more than happy to. Fabulous. We must yeah. please chat. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Ye